Today, we're on the ground for the final day of consensus 2024 in Austin, Texas. Marco Santori, Kraken's chief legal officer, breaks down the latest in the SEC's lawsuit against the crypto exchange. And Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse also sits down with us from consensus to explain why the blockchain firm doubled its contribution to a pro crypto super PAC. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World. I'm Mackenzie Segalos here in Austin, Texas for the final day of Consensus 2024. Let's get a check of the markets before we get to some of our interviews here. Crypto prices in the red to end the week and the month of May, with Bitcoin dropping back to the $67,000 level as of noon Eastern. Ether dipped less than 1% to $3,741, and Solana fell more than 2% to $164. Now, crypto's moves lower come as the Fed's preferred inflation gauge rose 0.2% in April, in line with Wall Street's expectations. Major cryptocurrencies are lower for the week, with Bitcoin down nearly 3%. For the month, however, crypto is in the green, with Bitcoin climbing more than 12 percent and Ether soaring a whopping 27 percent after the SEC approved a rule change last week, paving the way for spot Ether ETFs. Solana also soared this month, rising more than 34 percent. All right, let's jump right into more of our discussions here at Consensus. Yesterday, I sat down with Marco Santori, Kraken's chief legal officer, to discuss the SEC's approach of regulation by enforcement, the latest in the agency's lawsuit against the crypto exchange, and what happens next. So much to cover from a lot of the legislation that's winding its way through Congress uh, to what seems like a softening stance from the SEC. And I do want to start there with the commission. Uh, A lot of moves in your case recently. I think the most recent filing was to, again, try to dismiss the case altogether ahead of your hearing on June 12th. How are you feeling about uh, the status of all that? Look, this is a case that never should have been brought. It was about one year ago I testified on behalf of my client, Kraken, that the SEC would have to share the jurisdiction it was claiming over crypto with other federal agencies, the, like, like the CFTC. We don't think they like that because exactly one day later, almost down to the hour, we got the call saying they were going to sue us. We don't think this is a case that ever should have been brought, and as a result, we're moving to dismiss it. Um, we put in our moving papers a little while back. The SEC responded. We had one last chance to reply. Now the case is fully briefed. So uh, in a few weeks, we'll go in front of the judge of the Northern District of California, and we'll make our, uh, we'll make our, our oral arguments. We'll actually argue before the court uh, the, uh, the same things we argued in our moving papers. The SEC will have a chance to rebut, and uh, there will be a live argument, just like there was in Coinbase, just like there was in Binance. There, uh, there are similar cases. How confident are you that the judge will dismiss the case? Look, judges are reluctant to dismiss cases at the early stages, particularly when they're brought by the government. We have a lot of faith in our government, usually. We don't think this is a case that ever should have been brought. This is a case that is more politics than it is policy. We like to think the court's going to see that as well. Hey, you mentioned Coinbase also dealing with its own legal battle with the SEC. Part of their argument has been, you know, they listed, they went public, they jumped through all of the hoops necessary with the SEC in order to do that. And now being accused of operating an unregistered securities exchange seems to be a contradiction of all the due diligence that went through the listing process. And I guess my broad question to you is, are you talking to any of the other exchanges as you all fight similar battles with the commission? Yes. Yes. Short answer is yes, we are. Uh, I wouldn't say we're coordinating or anything like that, but we have to know what's going on in those other cases. The country has to know what's going on in those other cases. Um, So what you'll see is that the Coinbase case is a superset of our case. So there are more issues at issue in the Coinbase case than there are in our case. The SEC is suing Coinbase for, for example, staking. Uh, for their staking program. They're not suing us because we settled our claims with the SEC on on staking. The Coinbase case is a little bit farther ahead than ours is, just procedurally speaking. So um, we expect that their case will enter discovery very soon. It probably is actually they're starting to see discovery papers moving. Um, Our case, uh, we hope, never gets there if we're able to dismiss it at this early stage. But that would be the next step if if the case continues. Uh, Sticking with the SEC for a minute, a lot of people were very surprised by the decision last week uh, by the SEC to make this rules change that paves the way for spot Ether ETFs. It seemed to be this total about face by the agency. Were you surprised? And do you think that this speaks to a larger trend of the 
uh, of the regulators softening its stance on crypto more broadly? I got to tell you, I've been doing this for over a decade. I've been advising innovators and entrepreneurs in crypto since before it was crypto, since it was just Bitcoin. And for over a decade, I wake up surprised every morning. There's, there's nothing that doesn't surprise me about this. Uh, nobody knew, uh, except for probably a select few in the building at the SEC. And maybe they didn't even know uh, a few days before whether that was going to get approved or not. Um, it was approved. We are very likely now to see uh, an EBTF. Um, I think it does signal a shift in DC. Um, the industry uh, and the ecosystem and the community of users uh, have all been fighting a long fight on the Hill, at the agencies, to get the recognition that this technology deserves. Um, the last few months have been a meaningful shift, a meaningful shift in that. Um, there's <laughs> Washington, D.C. can swallow up more effort than any town on the planet. And make no mistake, there has been a ton of effort poured in to that town um, by those who believe that we can build a better financial system. And it's been happening over the course of years. But then in the course of weeks, we saw this dramatic shift. Uh, we've, seen the, we've seen the Biden administration um, start to think really hard about reaching back across the aisle and supporting the nonpartisan movement that's going on in Congress to support this industry and to support this ecosystem. Centauri also says that it's disappointing to see how far behind the U.S. is compared to other regions around the world as it relates to crypto regulation and discusses some of the progress made on Capitol Hill recently. You'll be able to check out his full interview over at CNBC.com slash crypto world. Now, I also sat down with Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse here at Consensus yesterday to discuss crypto regulation. He explained why it was important for the blockchain firm to donate another $25 million to the pro crypto super PAC Fair Shake and what he thinks about the SEC's approach of regulating the industry. So we're here at Consensus. On day one of the conference, you announced that you're investing another $25 million into Fair Shake. This is a pro crypto pack. Uh, and it's also on top of the $25 million that you gave them last year. Walk me through how you chose Fair Shake and, and how this investment uh, helps build towards your larger thesis. Look, it's incredibly important that the U.S. is competitive when it comes to the policy and regulatory environment in all things crypto. That's not where we have been, unfortunately. We've really had a pretty hostile regulatory environment in lots and lots of ways. And instead of doing the work to provide clarity and clear rules of the road, we've actually, I think in some ways, the SEC under Gensler has sowed confusion by filing lawsuits that sometimes even contradict each other. So for me, like supporting Fair Shake even more and even signaling that we're gonna to continue to do this, it's really about getting people elected who are pro-crypto, pro-innovation, but also are focused on protecting consumers. We think by getting that right mix, we're really moving the whole agenda forward and catching up with what we've already seen in other economies around the world. So later today, RFK will be speaking. He's at virtually every event I go to. Meanwhile, you had uh, Trump speaking to the Libertarian National Convention this past weekend in DC, saying very pro-crypto things. He's become more of the crypto candidate. Meanwhile, you've got Biden uh, apparently softening his stance on crypto, at least that's a perception among those in the sector. It seems like crypto is, is more a part of the conversation than it's ever been before in this presidential election cycle. Any thoughts on that dynamic? I mean, look, it's a magical time to be alive as part of my reaction to that. You know, 10 years ago, when I first really got deeply involved in crypto, I couldn't have predicted kind of what we're seeing today. But it's also, I feel like, the inevitable march of progress. These technologies can improve so many ways in which transactions are settled, more transparency, more, you know, faster, cheaper, and so to me, it's just, it's that forward progress. The fact that we have what should have been a bipartisan, broadly supported technology, somehow it became partisan. I really attribute that Elizabeth Warren in particular kind of stood out and spoke, I think, misinformation and saying like, well, everybody doing crypto is doing bad things. And just nothing can be further from the truth. There's so many examples even here at this conference of incredible entrepreneurs building incredible tools that can improve the efficiency of how tr financial transactions work. And look, some of our financial system was developed 50, 60 years ago. It's time to bring it into the internet age for the benefit of consumers, for the benefit of businesses. And to fight that progression, that inevitable march of progression, to fight that I think is, is just silly. So I do think seeing it the, the, the become a presidential topic, isn't that surprising to me? 
There's a lot of passion. I'm sure you felt it here as well. There's a lot of passionate people about this industry and they will vote their mind. And I think that's important. Well, and there are a lot of polls that are indicating just that, that crypto is increasingly an issue that they care about. Voters in swing states are expressing uh, more of an interest in the digital asset sector than before. We're also seeing a lot of pro-crypto legislation wind its way through Congress. So SAB 121 a couple of weeks ago, FIT 21 passing the House last week, seeing more Democratic support for these laws. Stablecoin legislation, uh, people are more bullish on that than they have been in past years. But do we see these things get to the finish line, signed into law by the end of the year? How optimistic are you? You know, if you're asking me whether they get signed into law before the end of the year, I'm probably a little bit skeptical that it, it happens before the election. Uh, you know, as we all have seen, the, the, the wheels of legislative progress move slowly and carefully. So I don't, I'm, I'm thrilled by the progress that we made in the last even three weeks. And I think it may have been the most important two or three weeks in the U.S. crypto evolution ever. But I still think getting that the, the legislation passed may, may require, you know, uh, after the election, maybe before the end of the year, more likely the first half of next year. But again, I view this as very, very positive because the winds have changed in how the U.S. government is looking at this. And we haven't yet seen explicit decisions from the Biden administration, but you have seen, as you described earlier, a softening of some of the rhetoric coming out of this administration. And I think driven by the fact that people understand this is a topic people care deeply about, and frankly, the fact that it's become a little bit partisan. And in a very tight election, this could be a, dec a deciding factor. Uh, as you said, the last few weeks have been pretty frenetic in terms of what's been going on in the crypto space. Last week, the SEC, many were surprised by the decision to make the rules change that was necessary to kind of pave the way for these spot Ether ETFs. What was your reaction? Inevitable. Uh, you know, the, the, the SEC, I think, has been losing in the courts. They've been losing in the court of public opinion. And I think increasingly they're losing in politics. And so, you know, we certainly saw that happen with the Bitcoin ETF. They were kind of dragged kicking and screaming into the approval of the Bitcoin ETF because of court decisions. And so I, I think that they knew if they didn't support and approve the, the ETH ETF, that likely the same thing was going to happen. And so I think that's also a very positive thing. But you know, the SEC lost in uh, on Capitol Hill with the voter on SAB 121. Uh, they obviously lost in the Ripple case. You know, I, I think that Gensler has, I think, had a misguided approach to how to regulate this industry. And he hasn't done the work that other countries around the world have done to provide that clarity, provide rules of the road and frameworks, whether it's the UAE, Japan, UK. And we just haven't done that here in the United States. We'll have that full interview and a whole lot more from this conference over at CNBC.com slash crypto world. OK, that's all for this week. But we'll be back again on Monday with more conversations from this event, including Mike Novogratz of Galaxy Digital and Franklin Templeton's Jenny Johnson. We look forward to seeing you then.